Yeah, this is an interesting thing for me. Like, why, as a nation, Singapore has always been so invested in exhibition making as a form? Like, and why, especially post-colonial states, have been? Mm -hmm. You know, like the the desire to make exhibitions in this region. I sometimes feel like from um, a power structure of government or whatever it seems to be more than actually sometimes in the U.S. or right. even sometimes in Europe. Like the, the outside of the gamut of just cultural exchange. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, and so, like, it's interesting, like, for example, that you will have ministries commissioning exhibitions and then expos will be taken. These, so, like, I, I don't know, like, I haven't done hardcore research on this, but I've always felt instinctually just through navigating the scene that there is this, um, this investment that comes out of the post colonial condition. Sure. I mean, part of it's just signaling. Uh, signaling an arrival of a new nation in in yeah. formats that uh, in exhibitionary formats that presume the nation state exactly upon entry, right? But the irony is that we are way beyond that now. Sure, you know, yeah. and yet why do why does the persistence why is there still a persistent desire to cling to this format? The other possibility is just that when we enter our our kind of independence moment mm -hmm. and post colonial moment, that we then entered. Uh, we entered the economic phase of economic development where we then uh, begin to consume and produce information in ways that that take on existing formats that uh, that parallel um, formats of global circulations. Like what I'm thinking of is like the trade show, you know. Yeah. 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 So other things that circulated well internationally and globally, they mm -hmm. those formats then get taken on as the ways we consume information and produce information. Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree with that. That yeah, that definitely it does happen, but there's also an inter interesting thing for me because I think that there's an there's a part of this that is also about subjectivity. Right. That exhibitions are are environments of constructing like citizenship. Yeah, not not even no. that. Like yes, citizenship, yes, but like not literally in the sense of signifier. Like you see a signifier, you get a sense of patronism. Right. Patriotism, but I think like from the way a show is hung, from the way you are guided or managed through an exhibition, mm -hmm. it creates a certain type of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like governance in four D, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or like our government has early, <laughs> early kind of uh, experienced <laughs> economists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and I really think like that there's a real reality to that because like um like Jennifer Lindsay's like essay on the Southeast Asia Cultural Festival kind of points to that okay. also. Like there is a side of cognition to the toward sort of forming these large spectacle programs and festivals together. But like on one hand the danger of speaking like this is to assume that there is a singular kind of desire, right? Like there is a government producing yeah. these things and producing. But I, I almost feel like it's a system that produces it. Sure. You know what I mean? And maybe a set of beliefs and a set of faith, or a, like a, a type of faith we have in the exhibitionary form being a revelatory moment that the experience is still important. Mm. So then what happens when you translate that online, right? Because online I find like a lot of exhibitions become really flat. And, they, and because the internet is an archive, so yeah. the question becomes like how do you an archive an experience yeah. and make that archived experience the primary experience sure. rather than a reference point to something else right and i feel like as we are still stuck in in between things right because the way we treat digital platforms for exhibitions is as archives and it's almost like a lot of policies push us in that direction because that's the mold that's been set right for like the way that we would want to travel let's say an exhibition internationally yeah right, in pre-COVID time. So it's almost like that's a template we have. But the reality is an online exhibition, in making an exhibition online, is almost making an exhibition for an entirely new media. Oh, landscape. totally. Yeah, I agree. And there seems to be a dis disjuncture in how we're making that and we're not addressing that. Yeah, and I also think that the that online exhibition formats as they currently exist, however good our mm -hmm. technology is, um, uh, responds very differently to the different scales of exhibitions. I don't yeah. feel like th those um, online exhibitions translate blockbuster scale exhibitions well. No, it's it's kind of um, exhausting and, yeah. and confusing to navigate a large yeah. exhibition back and forth. Whereas if you're translating a, a show the size of like one of the galleries at Napa, for example, right? yeah. 
then it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Or like one floor of yeah. AQ, then it's okay. Yeah. But trying to go through a whole building. On, no. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. It doesn't. It doesn't and, really work. And you know, this is the thing, like you can think about it. I've been thinking about it in different ways. Like, all right, what are we really trying to replicate in experience? It, and for me, I feel sometimes a lot of like 3D modeling that you see online, yeah. over stations, falls flat because it's trying to ex aspire to be the real thing. But like, the type of complexities of experience of being like in situ in a space mm -hmm. can't be captured in a 3D model. Sure. It still takes a kind of like a lot of um, intellectual leaps for one to understand the model, yeah. da, 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 whatever. It's a whole different experience. So it's almost like I feel like we have to break away from representational thinking to yeah. actually start thinking about media landscapes, period, which I don't even have the answers to. but. It's almost because then this is where the thinking gets kind of icky because it's like, do we gamify? I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we talking because, about game experience? Yeah. Also, yeah. gamified experience are the only scenarios I can think of. I mean, uh, should we you were send, talking about this at dinner, right? The yeah. gamified experience has a way to produce, they, they actively produce a narrative in a way that's also participatory narrative. Like, you can begin to shape exactly. your own story, right? Yeah. But, and what I like about gamified. <laughs> exhibition formats is that unlike the present online one you can see someone next to you yeah do you know like yeah. uh, it, so there's also the theory experience of going yeah. through all these online experience yeah. exhibition spaces alone yeah yeah like yeah. there's always never anyone else in the space yeah um, and then when you break away from representation then you could have also a very different uh, language of display yes yeah but you know one thing that this is okay so i've been thinking about this because <clears throat> I mean, like, in some of my past work, I've worked with programmers who are right. also artists. Right. And I'm actually very interested in, like, the systems of technology that surveil and how ex and they're parallel to certain types of experiential um, surveillance that happens in exhibition and painting work. Yeah. You know, like, historically, how, ex how the feedback form is a very important part of exhibition making, like, even during the Cold War. And it became a, a scientific, almost, tool, like, a metric, and it's one that we continue to use. Right. Um, but you can see similarly, th there's kind of like a metric to gamified experience where it, everything is a programmatic slot. And one of the things is like now I'm like working with Human Chong and really actually looking at how artists sometimes pr produce conceptual work that is fundamentally open ended. Mm -hmm. It kind of is this is as much as it's systematic, it's a different kind of systematic thinking than you have in game, right. game theory or game gamified experiences because it's almost like they gamify and this is something that I'm boring right now from a game that I play and, and programmer says this about the, the game which is horrible it's played by daylight not to promo it but like it's like an open it's um, an open world game it's not it's an okay. open platform game so okay. you can play with anyone in the world okay. but it's horrible because it's actually like you play a killer or you play uh, survivors okay. so it's like um and then you you know like you're in um, purgatory and you have to figure out how to escape the killer if you're a survivor and like kind of escape pur purgatory and or you're the killer you just have to go out and kill people right right and you know there's strategies to winning but it's actually really complicated to play because you're not playing against ai you're sure. playing against another human yeah but the programmer and i remember that when they did the anniversary they were taking kind of quotes and the programmer was saying that the way he built this is a series of as um if so if you know like if what yeah you know, or else, mm -hmm. you know, so it's literally like the way you think about game, the gamified environment, no matter how open ended it is, even if it's, you're playing against another human being right. who we could say has an infinite number of possibilities yep. of actions they may choose, it is still fundamentally coming down to a system of choices that come to exist at that. Yeah. And I think that there's something in the logic and thinking and experience of the artwork which supersedes that level of thinking. Okay. You know? And that is the hardest part for me about translating exhibitions online. And this is maybe where things fall apart for me, where the word is translate, because maybe it's not translate. That we just have to rethink the technology. Sure. To that kind of open-endedness. Because in a way, computation is always binary, ones and zeros. Yeah. Right? But sometimes the logics of that come out conceptual practices and experiences that you have with artworks or not even experiences, but just like engagement with them. Yeah. You know, the experience is less important than yeah, the yeah. narrative or whatever. But I would, it also makes me think that if you come up with an entirely new um, formats and technologies mm -hmm. to engage that, then there's also works that 
I mean, um, that won't that won't you know make the passage through that exactly. process. Yeah, that they really, really kind of like they really require physical spaces. Whereas yeah. there are other formats yeah. that are participatory that that they themselves are yeah. already open ended. Yeah. yeah. So like conceptual practices, I can see how they, they can they really translate. Yeah. I totally agree with you yeah. in that sense. But you see, then this becomes a really interesting question because then if we start to think of art as a form or a contingent of technologies and techn technological development, then can art in certain forms become obsolete? So like if you were to, yeah. yeah. Or that it's not even, um, it's not obsolete in the way that it becomes part of the OS, you know, so yeah. to speak, <laughs> right? It gets yeah, invisibilized. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like you could, you could, uh, you could take a drawing instruction by, yeah. um, what's his name? Not, uh, the contemporary to Judd. Um, Which one? Um, you know, this wonderful. He says, uh, he goes, draw a line and then make a 90 degrees. Is that solely so wet? No. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the solely wet yeah. uh, drawing instructions. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you could invisibilize the instruction in virtual space, so it doesn't actually require a physical environment. Yeah. No, those don't. That's true. That's yeah. true. But I mean, like, if, if we were to extrapolate the thinking of it, that if we maybe, so I guess. Just to come back to maybe the point is that the interesting thing about the digital environment for me is that at the end of the day, it comes down to certain sets of binary thinking. And we see this whether it's in social media, whether it is in um, the coding of a system, right? Yeah. Some people, I mean, I'm sure there's a computer scientist who will disagree with me, but I'm just thinking like even the way that we create frameworks or we create um, catalogs or systems of knowledge, it's still within a framework that is almost like, if this, then that. Sure. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. this kind of logic. So the, I wonder at some point if that is the crux that we kind of have to overcome. Sure. But it could also be like, you know, with, with all the, with all the uh, policy impetus towards yeah. like digitization oh, yeah, yeah. and all, all of that, then you could actually potentially have a, a, a set of coordinated policies that basically say, you know what, we are pushing, um, we are going to push the development of conceptual practices in contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then this just happens to be the moment in, te in technology, in correct, just, yeah. exactly, yeah. to push for it. And I mean, that would make a lot of sense because yeah. historically in the US in the 40, uh, in, sorry, in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, if you think about Development of the Rand Corporation and their use of artists being part of that, yeah. or even with Philip Macy's, yeah. where we talk about Aspen. Like, there is a modern art tradition in which artists and computation come together, mm -hmm. you know, and it it isn't an alien environment yeah. and it isn't a relationship that doesn't necessarily work together. It just means actually it needs a lot of really good policy and a very set of good research questions almost. Mm -hmm. But the question is whether we are even doing that because if we're treating the online space as a pure translation medium yeah i think we're always going to fall short totally. because i think like online experience like it's kind of like moving on analog to digital. yeah and then there's a whole i mean yeah. there's a whole history and current trajectory of the, the net art yeah which, right, is which we different. still haven't even yeah. addressed <laughs> yeah. which is kind of like sideswept or it's kind of broed out yeah. you know and yeah. which is not true it's not purely a bro space yeah. too um, yeah, no, I, I don't know, like there, there's a lot going on with that and this move towards online, which in a sense, we've been on this trajectory for a long time. Yeah. But COVID-19 has kind of just pushed us to confront that now yeah. as we try to quickly reorient ourselves. I mean, it's interesting about the discussions we have also, because like some of the discussions I'm having with friends and peers who run spaces or have budgets or we all run projects, right, is that COVID's kind of like a hard stop to recalibrate things, to rethink things, which is great. But but in a sense, this hard stop is almost impossible for certain mechanisms in the world to take on. So for example, if you get state funding, I'm not talking about Singapore, state funding in general, yeah. well, budgets have to be expended by a certain date, a certain time. Yeah, so yeah. they would rather go forward to have the exhibition in the space, yeah. even if no one's going to see it. Sure. You know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. that money has to be spent. No, I get it. Which is a very interesting... I think that's what's happening in like uh, in South Korea, right? Because in so many of the institutions get state funding. And then yeah. Yeah, it's really based on a yearly budget. If you, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't think, I'm not sure. And I can't really speak to South Korea. Right. You know? 
But I mean, this is just things that I've been told about other countries, not specifically South Korea. But yeah, that's possible mm. completely. Um, I but, think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the hot stuff I'm also thinking of is whether or not this moment will just produce um, a move away from certain kinds of uh, the production of certain kinds of spatial infrastructures. Right. We're thinking of certain, and then, and then. Pivoting so quickly to the to the digital space and producing technologies and uh, spaces that that it neglects the 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 kinds of spaces that we already don't have mm -hmm. physically, you know, and that we've pivoted away from yeah. without fully even addressing them. Yeah, no, I, to I totally, so, yeah. I totally. Agree which is the which is the thing that's happening now. We're seeing the loss of like small to medium nonprofits. Yeah. And I, but I honestly think that loss or that shift doesn't come from, um, doesn't come from just COVID nineteen. No. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I think we've had this discussion before that some of this really comes from uh, long-standing trajectories and trends um, and ways of thinking about how do you how do you measure success? How do you measure? Or metrics of growth, like, oh, we should think in five-year cycles, yep. you know, like policy planning should happen in five-year cycles, three-year cycles, or whatever, you know, and that also, like, the trajectory to think that sustainability is through getting bigger and bigger and bigger, in some senses, rather than keeping things at specific scales and allowing things to grow organically at scales. Um, so, I mean, those kinds of thinkings, I think, all honestly just came to a head and it just was unfortunate or fortunately met with COVID-19. I think this year would have just been a year where policy cycles expired on a certain level or something right, right. and leases expired, whatever, and just everybody happened at around the same time. Sure. You know, and then on top of that, you have um, COVID-19 hits and then it really brings into start, um, maybe because everyone's, first of all, a captive audience at home, second of all, um, yeah, so the one thing I realized is our attention spans have changed with COVID-19 in relation to this. Like that. Well, I do feel like in a sense, there is a sense that it's easier to reach to a larger audience now because people are captive at home right. and, or to their social media accounts or whatever that, um, and, or maybe people are not rushing to produce things. That's also or true, attend I think, yeah. things, you know? Yeah. And, and because of this kind of slowdown readjustment of timelines, there's a sudden, ability to engage with larger social issues. Mm. Does that make sense? Kind of. This is, I mean, an opportunity to just, uh, because of the pullback from production, a chance to just yeah. look at whether or not... Can I grab water, please? Oh, yeah. Yeah. To look at whether or not um, there are, uh, for the first time, just system-wide analysis of the of kind of issues that we could get at or finally propose fix or you know changes to mm. yeah. so that's also you know the the young people were talking about doing the saving spaces yeah no yeah. they are really inspiring and the yeah. fact that they got moved to question things yeah. all of a sudden and when they are just entering the sector yeah. and they're not act and maybe they're not as experienced as other people or initiated yeah. But to actually have a response that, hey, we, these are things we actually sure. need. And yeah. they didn't necessarily grow up with these things either. Yeah, but, no. And so that's what I kind of find Also, I find ref ref refreshing currently is the approach as a, is, is the lack of nostalgia. Yeah. You know, it's not an attempt to just hang on to something old that they think. haven't experienced. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Which I think is really at, like the rub of the argument. Because it's not trying to reinstate something, but it's just saying, look, this is important. Yeah. Yeah. for the landscape it needs to be safe yeah and then at the same time there's also like uh there's the safe space but there's also i think the I mean, partly because we are we are uh persuading them of the need for to just also discuss the the, the ways in which you can make space yeah right? not just to save them right yeah. to think about the yeah I the mean, other layers in the ecology that um are facing yeah. survival challenges for you know a host of other reasons post yeah COVID. I mean, I think this is the thing, right? Because COVID has really thrown into effect what it means to survive, right? And I think parallel to this, um, and I don't know whether I'll regret saying this, we'll see. But like, um, one thing that's fascinating is the discourse that we produced in light of COVID mm -hmm. 
this discourse of caring and we're trying to formulate what mutual aid means mm. what it means to support one another what it means to um and sometimes i wonder because you know like this sort of moment of crisis kind of narrows your lens very fast um and yet at the same time these discourses aspire to widen that lens so but it's interesting that the way that we develop this rhetoric is and i'm calling it rhetoric because the question becomes how do you actually show support yeah you know like what does it actually like i mean emotional support is one thing and i believe that emotional support is very important to provide and there needs to be those spaces in system in systems yeah. and ecologies and people need to care yeah. that definitely needs to happen but you can care so much and it still doesn't address the systematic changes we need yeah, which doesn't help anybody sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> you know i mean it, it seems to also come back to the the first premise right oh. of the of this conversation which is that then it, it seems to generate care primarily in the, in the form of making yet another exhibition yeah right so that seems to be the primary mode of vision care, care. and i understand that there's some yeah there's some useful um ways in which those things translate to employment, yeah. income, and so on. But yeah. I keep wondering whether or not there are other, you know, I mean, other ways to deliver those kinds, yeah. of, uh, those kinds of social good. Yeah. I mean, I think my philosophy when it comes to exhibition making is the exhibition has always been a means to an end. Right. Like, it's been a, it's been a means to mobilize capital. It's been a means to, sure. you know, like, to synthesize an argument or to put through an experience, which is kind of in which is important important to constellate in relation to something else that is happening and i think this comes back to like i think you've asked me before like about my practice as an art would be art historian like someone who yeah. studies exhibition histories right like i think what always goes back to my studies in exhibition histories is what exactly is happening around the exhibition what is the exhibition exactly mobilized to do mm. you know and it's sometimes like and I, I think I'm still convinced of that, that the exhibition as a moment, as a form of signaling, whatever, is still an important form of mobilization of a form of infrastructure to allow other opportunities to happen. Um, I haven't, I, I don't disregard that at all. I still think that's important, but then it becomes very, but what becomes interesting is when the exhibition itself, not so much as a system of mobilization, mm -hmm. but as a form of representation becomes that mode of providing support. Right, right. right? Because for me, an exhibition, like showing an artist, right? Right. Is, that's great. You yeah. know, it's great. Sure, someone gets 30 minutes, or yeah. not 30 minutes, 30 days yeah. to show their work. They feel good. It's on their wall. Their name's on the wall. Blah, blah, blah. But for me, the best kinds of exhibitions show different artists together mm -hmm. who in their relationships or bring together benefit the respective artists. Does that make sense? Yeah. So not just mobilizing capital in the sense of production money to produce new work and new yeah. research, but also what is this moment of representation together? There's a certain type of solidarity I think that comes out of exhibition making yeah. that people kind of underestimate what that means. Yeah. And so I think like as a curator, your tools are always when you're making an exhibition, there is the physical experience. Mm -hmm. There is the popular experience of the exhibition, which would be the people coming through the exhibition, the social media, the kind of uh, press that you corral around one, right? And then there is the the tool that is working with the institutions, mm -hmm. you know, mobilizing those organisms along the same way. And, and the reality is it's never a curator acting in isolation yeah. these are all feedback systems yeah. that you're working with yeah. right um and these are all part of that process of making and mobilizing right but what happens is when we play i think what happens and falls short is when we put all those moments of element of care to the moment of what am i showing and the act of showing becomes the moment of care then we kind of miss something sure. you know yeah yeah because that's when it really falls apart yeah and for me the institutions also really i mean part, part of me also wants to nudge oh. uh, nudge aside the the exhibition as that primary site for Caring. constructing that yeah. those forms of solidarity and i understand that this it yeah. still remains possible yeah. and i want to hold to that moment as well but i think also that that um that kind those kinds of spaces 
takes up so much uh, institutional room at the moment. Uh, and I think also the way that it, that the the way it occupies quite literally space in Singapore, it leaves out um, other social formations that could take place within the institutional uh, space. I, I agree that, with you. That could also build and construct those solidarities. And I think that's also the moment for other kinds of uh, curatorial potentials to yeah. to to not Come no together. longer correct, yeah, to no longer just like yeah. uh, stay in latency, but actually yeah. produce interesting yeah. uh, methodologies and uh, new ways of putting audience and artists and institutions yeah. and capital in together. And correct, all all together yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I think you're totally right, and I think maybe that's where the lost opportunity really is because I always think like the will to create an exhibition. I don't mean just like curatorially yeah. because sometimes like I think that as like a Nietzsche language. Oh really? Is it? <laughs> Is it <laughs> oh, 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 oh I didn't even catch that. But yeah maybe uh oh. <laughs> We're going down a very dark path. <laughs> but no, just, the just, will I know, but the will to almost the will to exhibit in yeah. the sense that there is that political will, there's the the financial will. They're willing to put financial capital. Like that is an interesting thing to unpack. And play to and work you know and it's just kind of like if we literally just treat ourselves as vendors to that will yeah yeah then we aren't act are actually mobilizing anything we're being mobilized yeah yeah you know and, and that that's that's fine you know sometimes it, it, yes it, it, that's fine sometimes but you like just have to be aware of that you know um yeah but i think that but then you see the thing that interests me is and the part that maybe comes out from all my earlier kind of more historical research is where does this will to exhibit come out in relation to the commissioner yeah and the artist and whoever is funding also, you know like where how, how how do these interplays come together and then actually produce something interesting yeah but also how is the you are, are asking these questions leading me to material and cybernetics which is always an interesting point like oh talking. well i guess because it was very important for me that when the cyberneticians like margaret like okay yeah. I'm, I'm retrospectively describing this book because she does in in the end contribute to cybernetics um as well and um gregory bateson yeah um, you're looking at them as always yeah. kind of like proto yeah well because they write about it yeah. they write about the importance of the exhibitionary mm. or the exhibition they write about um it's almost like the exhibition becomes a prime prime kind of educator the kind the kind of subjectivity creation so i mean like there are a couple books right now that i uh, or there are a couple scholars that really inform my way of thinking around this which is fred Fred Turner, mm -hmm. when he writes about the democratic surrounds, which is really this idea of the creating of an exhibitionary environment in which democratic subjectivity is produced through exhibition design. Mm -hmm. And there's a fundamental belief because these cyberneticians, so this whole feedback system, you know, and I, and I kind of like this, like, and I do believe well, sometimes we're in a feedback system, like when you enter an exhibition um, and you know, the complexity of your experience in relation to the ex exhibition is a discussion sure. that goes back and forth, goes back and forth, that yeah. kind of like is a feedback system that constructs then your subjectivity. For me, Bateson, a la Fred Turner's theory is that what what is designed is um, a multi-perspective view in an exhibition so that one in the ability to choose one constructs a democratic subjectivity. So I'm really interested in how exhibition styles designs mm -hmm. are thought of mm -hmm. in relation to the experience i mean of course i can't write most of this because the historical facts or sure. evidence don't exist there sure. but if we were to speculate and think about this kind of subjectivity making coming out of exhibition styles and the way that the art our artworks are related together um that's really where that comes from yeah, and yeah. and it relate and for me it's more than that i i'm interested in the cybernetic um, definition of the exhibition is constructing type of subjectivity um, as an early sort of premise before I move on to start to think about you know we start to see a lot in the 60s and 70s and I have to go back to my archive to be exactly sure but I've, I've come across articles like of artists writing about hanging paintings on walls at homes right. and I'm really interested in the interior design of homes in relation to how you hang paintings in there and, and I think that this has to do with the rise of not just the idea of environments create certain types of subjectivities, sure. the objects we own create certain types of subjectivities, but also like middle class consumption. Mm. 
you know, like what is the place of the painting or what is the place of the artwork or the ceramic or the whatever in the yeah. home, you know? And so all of this kind of comes together for me because it's sort of like, what are the environments we create to create ourselves? Yeah, totally. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that on a larger scale, this question can be applied to systems of governance when we think yeah. about culture. And it's also a lot of the thinking behind the kind of high modernist urban planning, right? Mm -hmm. Which, mm -hmm. how do you create the ideal city that then creates the ideal in us? Yeah. Individual. And, yeah. and, and so it's a, it's a moment in history I'm interested in, I should say. I, I don't take these thoughts as thoughts that are truths that we should function yeah. in within now. Yeah. You know, because I do think our experience is fundamentally different. And, you know, like the the types of audiences we had to have for exhibitions in the 50s, 60s, and 70s are very different from now because yeah. that was that was media then. Yeah. And right? you can reverse the question also, like yeah. what's the kind of democracy that we want now that would then produce the exhibition? Exactly. We want to see which would exactly. then be. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, but the different technologies we have now are those that are emerging out of social media and what um, is called surveillance capitalism, right?